Okay, thank you, Michael, and uh, thank you, everyone. I'm very happy to be back here again after having been, as Michael said, here twice in the fall for um, Alfred Dublin. But now I'm going back a couple of centuries to the 18th century, uh, and we're talking about Nathan the Wise. Now, Nathan the Wise was written by a Gentile. I mean, almost everyone you read in this book club has, was Jewish. But we're reading Nathan the Wise because it was the first major work of European literature to portray a Jew sympathetically. Moreover, it was the most iconic play for assimilated German Jews in the 19th and early 20th centuries. There's much to say about it and much has been said and written about it, but today I want to briefly focus on five themes. Now we go, okay, now it works. So the five themes I want to briefly address are um, the Enlightenment and its attitude towards organized religion, the life of its author, Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, the life and thoughts of Moses Mendelssohn, who inspired the figure of Nathan, the historical period in which the uh, play is set, namely the Crusades and the reign of Saladin in Jerusalem, and the play itself and its reception. Now, Nathan the Wise is one of the most important works, and certainly the most important work of fiction of the German Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was the dominant philosophical movement of 18th century Europe, and it was centered in England, Scotland, France, and the German states. One of its major principles was to break away from established religions and embrace natural science. In short, to favor what one could learn with one's own, one's own eyes and ears and what one could analyze rationally over what was written in any sacred scripture. The established churches fought against this attitude and had been doing so since the time of Copernicus and Galileo back in the 16th century. The philosoph, that is the followers of the Enlightenment, considered the established Christian churches to be the greatest threat to freedom of thought, not just in matters of science, but also theology and philosophy. The Catholic Church in particular had established the Inquisition to combat heresy. Up until the 18th century, in the Italian states, in Spain, and in France, the practice of Protestantism was forbidden, and citizens could be tortured and executed for religious infractions such as blasphemy and witchcraft. Now the philosophers found these conditions despicable. At the very least, they thought that all religions should be tolerated. That is, all people should be free to practice whatever faith they chose. At the extreme, some thinkers rejected religion in all of its forms. In the 1720s, for example, a book began to circulate entitled the treatise of the three imposters. Now the three imposters of the title were Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. Although issued anonymously, its authors were probably three men living in Amsterdam. And it is quite a read. Not only do they call Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad tricksters and deceivers, the book also derides their followers as morons and imbeciles. But most followers of the Enlightenment were not so negatively disposed to religion. There was another option, namely religious pluralism. This was a step beyond mere toleration of all religions, insofar as it held that all religions, at least the Abrahamic ones, were at least partly true, but no one religion had a monopoly on theological or ethical truth. That is, uh, it held that these three figures were not imposters, rather they were very wise men, and that each in their own way had elements of theological and ethical truth. In other words, the truth was shared among them. What, how could you tell what was true? Well, the philosopher said the truth could be ascertained by using reason, by employing, employing the rational faculties which God had given us. But this also implied that one did not need revealed religion, you didn't need the Bible or the Quran to determine the most fundamental theological and moral principles. They were embedded in the sacred texts, but one did not need those texts to establish valid moral principles. 
Now, this was the attitude of Gotthold Ephraim Lessing. Lessing was one of the first Germans who could be considered what was called a man of letters. He wrote theoretical books and essays, as well as a number of plays, which are performed in Germany to this day. And the most famous of those plays is Nathan the Wise. Lessing had an open and affirmative attitude towards religion. He famously said that the search for truth and knowledge and faith was even more important than the acquisition of it. I quote from his uh, letter to his brother, quote, if God had all, held all truth in his right hand and the sole everlasting search for truth in his left, with the result that I should be determined to be forever and always mistaken and said to me, choose, I would humbly pick the left hand and say, Father, grant me that. Absolute truth is for you alone. Now, this being the case, Lessing was critical of Christianity, which was the religion in power, and which used that power to suppress other religions. Lessing was conversely sympathetic to Judaism, which was one of those religions that were being suppressed. Now, in 18th century Germany, Jews basically had no rights. At best, their presence was grudgingly accepted, but they could be expelled at a moment's notice. Jews were prohibited from owning land, and they were prohibited from practicing most professions. Thus, they were left with trade and banking, but very few were wealthy enough to be bankers. By the 16th century, over 80% of Jews wandered the country in abject poverty as peddlers or vagabonds. I mean, think of the reading we did last month, which portrays the 14th century Jewish cities, and, and the characters we saw there were all quite well off, you know, as business people, as merchants. Well, that was not the typical Jew, either in the 14th century or in the centuries thereafter. Most of them really were peddlers, vagabonds, uh, extremely impoverished. Um, by 1700, there were probably only 60,000 Jews in all of the German states, which was less than one half of 1% of the total population. Now, the situation in Berlin, where Lessing spent much of his life, was this. All Jews had been expelled from Berlin in the late Middle Ages. Then in 1669, uh, after all Jews were expelled from Vienna, the ruler of Prussia allowed some of those Viennese Jews to move to Berlin, namely the 50 richest Viennese Jewish families, that is, those who could contribute most to the Prussian economy. But those Jews had to pay heavy taxes and were not allowed to build a synagogue. That changed in 1712. The Jews were allowed to build a synagogue, but only after having purchased from the state the right to do so. Berlin's Jewish population proceeded to grow in the early 18th century to such an extent that in 1737, the King of Prussia ordered half of Jews in Berlin to leave the city. Thus, Berlin was relatively tolerant compared to other German cities, but its Jews had no rights and could be expelled at any time. Lessing criticized such treatment of Jews and the negative stereotypes with which they were characterized. In 1749, he published a one-act play entitled The Juden, The Jews. It deals with a nobleman who spouts anti-Semitic opinions until he is saved from robbery by a stranger who turns out to be Jewish. Five years after publishing The Juden, Lessing met Moses Mendelssohn. What brought them together at first was their mutual passion for playing chess. But they were also both of the same age, both were born in 1729, and both were proponents of the Enlightenment. Mendelssohn, who went by the name Mausche, son of Mendel in his youth, was born to a poor family in Dessau. As a very young man, he was a very smart student of the Bible and the Talmud, when his local teacher was appointed rabbi in Berlin, he was allowed to follow him there in 1743. But Mausche had to ent enter Berlin through the one gate that allowed Jews to pass. It was the same gate used for livestock to enter the city, and he had to pay the same head tax as if he himself were a cow. At this time, Mausche knew only two languages, 
Hebrew and Yiddish. He did not know how to speak high German, but that changed over the ensuing years. Young Mausch was eager to learn everything. He learned how to read high German, French, English, Greek, and Latin. He also started to read works by Enlightenment thinkers. When Mausch turned 21, he ended his studies in the Talmud school, and he was hired by a rich Jewish silk merchant to tutor his children. As a tutor, he could devote more time to his wide ranging interests, and he soon became friends with Lessing. He also started to write and publish and eventually adopted the Germanized name Moses Mendelssohn. His fame started to spread. In 1763, the Prussian Academy of Sciences sponsored an essay contest. It solicited answers to the question whether the existence of God and morality could be proved on a scientific basis. The contest was won by Mendelssohn. The second prize went to Immanuel Kant. Mendelssohn developed this idea further in a book entitled Phaidon, or the Immortality of the Soul, which came out in 1767. And this was an attempt to update Plato's book Phaidon, which has Socrates discoursing on the soul. Mendelssohn argued that the existence of God and human immortality could be proven through reason. One did not need the Bible to establish these points. The book became a bestseller and Mendelssohn was soon known as the German Socrates. I mean, here on the frontispiece to the book, you can see um, uh, Socrates in prison and he's contemplating a skull, which obviously means death, but on top of the skull, is a butterfly, which uh, represents the immortal soul. Uh, and soon Mendelssohn himself, uh, because of this treatise, came to be equated with Socrates. Uh, Socrates, Mendelssohn, and again, the skull with the immortal soul on top of it. Two years after the publication of Phaidon, Phaidon Mendelssohn received unwanted attention in the so-called Lafater affair. In the early 1760s, Johann Kasper Lafater, a Swiss Calvinist theologian, visited Berlin and befriended Mendelssohn. But then in 1769, in an open letter, Lafater publicly challenged Mendelssohn to either refute the doctrines of Christianity or to convert. Mendelssohn widely, wisely declined the challenge, um, but it did inspire, you know, decades later, this picture which is the iconic picture of Lessing Mendelssohn, uh, including La Fata. And of course it was used to advertise the book club. The picture is totally wrong. It's iconic, but totally wrong. What's wrong about it? Well, uh, Mendelssohn and La Fata um, met face to face in Berlin in the early 1760s at a time when Lessing was not there. Uh, so Lessing should not be in the picture. Moreover, they are discussing this book, which was at the heart of their debate, uh, rather, which was at the heart of Lafater's challenge in 1769. Um, but they didn't discuss that book face to face. That was done through the media of the time. Uh, so uh, it's this constellation in terms of both date and who's there is wrong. By the way, that's uh, from at Guggenheim, who's Mendelssohn's wife. Uh, but still, it's an iconic picture. Uh, one interesting fact is. Uh, here we have Lessing who looks totally pissed off. Now, why is he ticked off? Well, there are probably two reasons. First of all, he doesn't like what Lafater is doing. I mean, for a Christian to a challenge to Jew to say either disprove Christianity or um, convert, that's, that's medieval. I mean, you know, at various times in the Middle Ages or even, you know, earlier, uh, the Christian churchmen had called rabbis to them and said, look, either refute our beliefs or convert. And Lafata was doing the same thing. So that's one thing that ticks Lessing off. Um, the other thing that's ticking him off is it's obvious that Mendelssohn and Lessing have been playing a game of chess and this guy, you know, barges in and disrupts their game. Uh, lots is going on in this picture. It's not historically accurate, but it's really fun to play with. So, um, back to uh, the narrative, it's important to note that Mendelssohn did not believe that reason or rational religion should replace traditional religion. 
he believed that they could come to the same conclusions and could coexist. Indeed, throughout his life, Mendelssohn held closely to Jewish dietary laws. He kept kosher, and he sometimes could not attend dinners of like-minded philosophers. He also stayed home on the Sabbath. These beliefs culminated in the publication of his book, Jerusalem, in 1783, which argued that Judaism could exist in harmony with Enlightenment ideas. More generally, Mendelssohn marks the beginning of the integration of Jews into German culture. He advocated that Jews speak High German, not Yiddish, and he himself translated the Torah into High German. But what's interesting about this volume is it's, it's translated into High German, but it's still written in Hebrew script. And the commentary on it is in Hebrew. So it's really a transitional work. I mean, it's like the, uh, like the, the Hebrew Bible is translated into High German, but it's obviously just for a Jewish audience because it's written in Hebrew script. Now, with all this background, we can finally turn to Lessing's play, Nathan the Wise. It really is about Europe in the 18th century, and the characters are very 18th century in their attitudes. And as I mentioned, Nathan was in part inspired by Moses Mendelssohn. But the play is set in Jerusalem in the late 12th century, when Saladin, the Sultan of Egypt and Syria, ruled that city. That was during the time of the Crusades, when Christian armies tried several times to recapture Jerusalem from the Muslims. Now, the first crusade was launched in 1096. And the first thing the German Knights did was slaughter the Jewish communities of the Rhineland in Speyer, Worms, and Mainz. The idea was that, you know, you know we're going to go halfway across the known world to slaughter the unbelievers there. So let's start at home by killing the Jews. Um, and this, this slaughter of the Rhineland Jews in uh, 1096 was really the first major pogrom in European history. It took 250 years for the Jewish communities to be rebuilt. And then as you know from last month's reading in the 14th century, they were wiped out again at the time of the plague. Now, when the Crusaders captured Jerusalem three years later in 1099, they slaughtered its Muslim and Jewish citizens. Some 30,000 people were butchered by the Crusaders in Jerusalem over the course of three days. Conversely, when Saladin reconquered Jerusalem 90 years later in 1187, he did not kill the Christians, but allowed them to ransom themselves. The rich Christians quickly paid off their ransoms, but when Saladin saw the poor Christians being sold into slavery and families being torn apart, Saladin was so moved to tears that he let many of them free. And generally, the Muslims were astounded that the rich Christians purchased their own freedom, but would do nothing for the poor Christians. Saladin also allowed Jews to resettle in the city. Saladin's unexpected generosity towards Christians laid the basis for his generally good reputation in Europe for the ensuing centuries. Now, we can see that good reputation 150 years after Saladin's death in Boccaccio's The Cameron. The work was composed in the wake of the Black Death, the plague that struck Florence in 1348. And as we learned in last month's reading, that was the year that Jews were massacred once again in the Rhineland. After they had spent, as I just said, 250 years rebuilding their communities after the disaster of the First Crusade. Boccaccio's Decameron recounts how seven women and three men flee Florence to Fiesole, where they quarantine themselves and tell each other a hundred stories over the course of 10 days. One of the first stories, the third story on the first day is told by Philomena, who is the lady here in the middle. She recounts a tale about Saladin, who was portrayed in noble terms. Saladin's many wars are, however, very expensive, and he hopes to get a loan from a rich Jew named Melchizedek. Since he thinks that Melchizedek will balk at this request, Saladin tries to put him on the defensive by asking him, which of the three religions is the true one, Judaism, Christianity, or Islam? 
Melchizedek immediately realizes that he is getting ensnared, so he relates the story of the three rings with the punchline that the true religion cannot be ascertained. Impressed, Saladin confesses his ruse to Melchizedek, who promptly loans Saladin the money he needs, and the two remain friends for life. Here in this early uh, edition of the um, Decameron, here you've got Saladin uh, with Melchizedek telling him the story of the three rings, and at the end, Melchizedek uh, loans Saladin the money that Saladin needs. Now, in Nathan the Wise, written over 400 years later, Lessing appropriated the tale of the three rings from Boccaccio to serve as the central message of the play. I will not go into the many themes raised by the play since that is what we're going to discuss among each other today. But I do want to highlight three points. First, the play is written primarily for a Christian audience and its criticism is mainly directed against fanatical Christianity. There are no bad Jews and Muslims in the play. Nathan, Saladin, Sitta, and Al-Hafi have their faults, but they are ethically upright people. By contrast, the Christian patriarch is an evil and deceitful figure. Daya is generally well-meaning, but totally indoctrinated by Christianity. And the Templar too vacillates. By contrast, the friar is a good figure, as is the Templar in the end. The play's attack against Christian extremism, exemplified by the patriarch, places it squarely within the Enlightenment. A second theme is also central to the Enlightenment, namely that there is one core morality valid for all people at all times and all places. Nathan tells the Templar that there are good human beings in all countries. The differences among people are insignificant, limited to differences, quote, in color and clothing, in form, end of quote. Nathan proceeds to ask, quote, are Christians and Jews more Christians and Jews than human beings, end of quote. Moreover, the ethical precepts to which all people should subscribe are pretty straightforward. Um, Charity is one of them. Both Saladin and Nathan are generous to the poor, regardless of what their faith is. Toleration and acceptance of other viewpoints is also clearly a virtue that is propounded throughout the play. The generally valid morality is summed up by the judge in the tale of the three rings. He tells the three sons that they should prove their worth by demonstrating uncorrupted love without prejudice, gentleness, heartfelt tolerance, charity, and, sub and sincerest submission to God. And my third point is that the play implies that the goodness of people is determined not by their beliefs, but by their deeds. Protestantism and Islam assert that you can be saved by faith alone, but Lessing implies that good deeds are more important than thoughts or words or beliefs. Uh, as Nathan tells Rechia, don't you understand how much easier pious worship is than doing good? How happily the laziest person just piously worships to avoid having to do any good. Finally, I'm going to briefly discuss the reception of the work. It was published in 1779, and that year it was a bestseller at the Leipzig Book Fair. It sold 30,000 copies, which was a tremendous print run at the time. It was premiered on stage four years later in 1783 in Berlin. The book was, however, banned in many German cities, in Augsburg, Frankfurt, Würzburg, and all of Saxony. And it was banned because many authorities thought it cast Christians in a bad light. The Christian patriarch of Jerusalem is, after all, a symbol of power-hungry intolerance. The fact that Jews and Muslims seem to be better people than some of the Christians in the play was also galling to the Christian authorities. Conversely, with the spread of liberal and enlightened ideas, Nathan came to be seen as the quintessential play of the German Enlightenment. It had special meaning for Jews. In 1812, the Prussian state ordered all Jews to adopt surnames for record keeping purposes. And at that time, many Jews adopted the name Lessing. 
That's why many German Jews are called Lessing because their families adopted, you know, the name of the author of this play is their last name in the early 19th century. Throughout the 19th and into the 20th centuries, educated and assimilated Jews considered Nathan the Wise the landmark work of German literature. There was, however, opposition to the play by two significant groups of Jews. First, it was opposed by Orthodox rabbis on religious grounds. Like Christian traditionalists, they balked at the idea that there was no essential difference between Judaism and Christianity. If religious and moral beliefs could be reduced to a few simple precepts, why was there a need to have any formal religion at all? Moses Mendelssohn remained both a practicing Jew and a proponent of the Enlightenment, and he saw no contradiction between the two. But Orthodox Jews feared that Enlightenment precepts would hollow out Judaism. This criticism continues to be voiced today. A couple of years ago, when I taught the play to undergraduates here at Johns Hopkins University, an Orthodox Jewish student asked me, what is left of Judaism if one subscribes to Nathan's views? A second objection was, it was feared that the adoption of Enlightenment views would lead to excessive assimilation, and that too would spend the L, spend, spell the end of Judaism. That criticism was leveled against Mendelssohn in his own lifetime, again by Orthodox rabbis. Their fears seemed to be realized when eventually four of Mendelssohn's six children converted to Christianity. The problem was this, if there is no essential difference between Judaism and Christianity, and if there are substantial benefits to being Christian in a predominantly Christian society, what is there to stop one from being baptized? This question was asked more pointedly after 1900 by the Zionists who blamed the play for encouraging Jews to assimilate into German society. In fact, for that reason, the play is hardly ever performed in Israel today. I think there have been only three productions of Nathan since the founding of Israel, and those productions had little public resonance. Now these caveats have shaped the performance history of Nathan the Wise for the past 90 years. For the first 100, 150 years, it was performed as a positive and upbeat work. But the turning point came, of course, in 1933. Obviously, the Nazis immediately banned performances of the play, at least for Aryan audiences. But they did allow it for Jewish audiences. Within weeks of Hitler's coming to power, all Jewish actors were fired from their jobs, but they were allowed to perform for exclusively Jewish audiences under the auspices of the newly founded Jewish Culture League. The first performance of the Culture League in October 1933 was Nathan the Wise. But the largely assimilated German Jewish audience found this production disconcerting. For one, Nathan was, in quotes, very Jewish. Before 1933, productions tended to downplay Nathan's Jewishness in terms of speech and appearance. But in this production, at the very outset, Nathan was heard humming a Hasidic song off stage. other as the curtain falls. But the fact of the matter is this. By the end, we learn that everyone on stage is related by blood to everyone else except for Nathan. So in the 1933 production, the Christians and Muslims walked joyfully off stage together, leaving Nathan alone. He then slowly and sadly headed home by himself. This ending shocked Berlin's assimilated audience in October 1933, but it told them where they stood and what their fate would henceforth be in Germany. It is a staging that was emulated after the war as well. 
Granted, after 1945, many German theaters reopened with performances of Nathan, and they were overwhelmingly positive and uplifting. In fact, one reason why Nathan is not performed in Israel is because many believe that the play was instrumentalized in post-war Germany as a form of pretend philo-Semitism. But some socially critical productions of Nathan have repeated the 1933 ending to underscore the ultimately disastrous failure of German Jewish assimilation. There was an especially famous production in East Berlin at the Deutsches Theater, which ran for 25 years. There too, at the end, the Christians and Muslims walked happily off stage while two enormous steel gates slammed shut on Nathan's face, leaving him alone on stage. I will end there. Didn't mean to end on a pessimistic note, but I did want to highlight that this play at first reading might seem to be straightforward, but actually there's maybe more to it than meets the eye uh, at, at first glance. 